Pascagoula Prowler. The Rougarou has been prowling and patrolling Pascagoula long before the Phantom Barber terrorized the region. Monster alligators, poisonous snakes, and hogs the size of cars know to avoid the werewolf of Fever Swamp. The local tribesmen have stories and encounters that date back to the beginning of the land while the people of the bayou are still encountering this beast to this day. Protect your pets along Pascagoula. The prowlers are closer than you think. Creatures and mystery are no stranger to Mississippi. Ancient tribes once inhabited these lands and mysteriously vanished, leaving behind ruins and artifacts. There have been countless mounds and temples discovered throughout the state. They have excavated giant skeletons from those camps. Some believe bayous in the south were carved out by the giants that Jack slayed. In 1973, the entire town of Pascagoula had UFO fever after hundreds of people witnessed unexplained lights in the sky. The Navy clocked a vehicle moving at incredible speeds over the bayou. But two men encountered the otherworldly beings near a shipyard on an uncomfortable level. They were later picked up by the police and relayed their story. While catfishing, they witnessed multiple creatures climb out of a spacecraft, hovering above the water. The three aliens took the men after they fainted in terror. The creatures took the guys to a brightly lit room on the ship. There was a giant floating eyeball that inspected and scanned them up and down. The beings had no eyes, pincer hands, and gray elephant skin. A feminine creature inspected them and put her fingers down their throat and nose. After choking, she telepathically told them that everything would be okay. The next thing the men knew, they were back on the fishing pier. The men were unharmed, but terrified. One ditched his clothes because he was scared that he would contaminate the world with his alien germs. The police recorded the men, and it's stunning. The story made national news and was one of the first alien abduction mysteries of modern America. Last October, in the quiet Mississippi town of Pascagoula, two local men confronted authorities with a rather bizarre story. Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker told of a strange craft landing near their fishing site and of being taken aboard by three unearthly creatures. The two men were questioned under hypnosis and lie detectors, but their story remained intact. One of the men suffered a nervous breakdown and is still under treatment. Among the skeptics were Ralph and Judy Blum already at work on a UFO book. With W5 last week, Ralph and Judy returned to Pascagoula. Judy and I stumbled into this book. It it came to us to be written. Uh, Suddenly we were in a wave of waves. UFOs were being seen across the country again. We were in what they call a flap. And people began experiencing things that they couldn't explain. Something was happening in our skies, in the midst of Watergate, Agnew, the energy crisis, the Middle East. Something was happening, and people couldn't understand what it was. We spoke about UFOs, but nobody really knew. And then, uh, then it hit right here, where we are. It hit Pascagoula. Uh, Charlie Hickson entered the news, and we had a book to write. Something happened October of 73 That would go down in history The spaceship came with many blue lights Set down near them in the night Three little men came out and took them inside They looked him over with one big eye They say what they saw was the real They know they were the ones that saw the past To a UFO we were sitting on the other side of the pier with our, our feet, you know, over toward the river, fishing in, in the river. And the fish still wasn't biting, so I told Calvin, I said, well, you know, we might as well go home. But I guess that was when I heard it. It was some kind of zipping sound. And when I turned on around in this area out here, about 40 or 50 feet out there, uh, it was some, some kind of crab, you know. It was it looked like it's going to come right onto the ground. But it, it came on down and hovered about oh, about a foot and a half or, or two feet off of the ground. But we didn't know what to do, you know. Uh, the river behind us and and uh, that out there, not knowing what it was. So, and then before we uh, had time to really do anything, it seemed like an open appeared. Uh, and toward the end, it was, you know, toward us. And... 
the blue light, it had, it had blue flashing lights as it was, you know, approaching the ground, but then they went out, and when the opening appeared, some source of light came from the inside. It was just almost blinding. Sheriff Diamond, can you tell me just what happened that night? No, sir, I can't. All I can tell you is there was two men came into the Sheriff's Department approximately 8.30 and 9 o'clock. They were all excited and upset. Want to climb the walls, hysterical, crying. That's actually all I know is what happened. I mean, as far as me seeing what happened, I don't know. Of course, uh, we could see them in, in, the, in the opening coming from, you know, when it was started out to cry. But Did I you couldn't think it tell. was people coming out at first? Well, or they, they had, they had, uh, well, I, I kind of thought it was people at first, you know, off like that. But of course, when they when they appeared there in, in front of me, um, it was the most shock I've ever had in my life. What, what did you see? Um, well, they 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 were they were shorter than me. I'd say about five foot two or three, and they didn't have a neck. They, they had it seemed to come directly to their shoulders, and they had something uh, it, it came out to a point about where a, a nose would be. And, and on each side, the ears. And I believe that they looked like they were a little longer on the ears than the nose. But still pointed the ears. They were still pointing, yes. But since I was down there, and since I was a physician, and several other scientists and investigators were asked to, to uh, consult and, uh, and look into the situation, I was asked and if would I mind if I would be present. And I said I wouldn't mind at all. And while it is still very difficult for us to believe that a, that a, a, a spaceship landed and that robot-type uh, creatures came out and actually took these two people into, into the spaceship. These men, in, in my opinion, believe that they saw this and that they were being honest in reporting what they have reported. But it seemed to me when they came out that doorway, or that opening or whatever it was, then just almost instantly they were right there on us. And uh, their arms, they had arms, it, and I saw the arm moving here and, and in the shoulders but they had webbed, I mean, their, their fingers were webbed, and then they had something like a thumb, and they were like this. Mm -hmm. We questioned them at length, and then we left the room and recorded every, every, all the conversation they had, recorded between the two of them. And one of them kept wanting to pray. And he said, I, after all I went through on this earth, I said, why should I have to see something like this? Calvin Parker, I was questioning him and at one time, he wanted to climb the wall. That's how, how nervous and how shook up he was. They had me uh, one on this arm like this, and on the other one, you know, they had my other arm like that. And they just, I just seemed to lift up to the same height they were off the ground, and, and we just moved into the crack. Now, inside, how did, they, how did they lay you out? Do you remember how it happened? Uh, yes. Uh, they, I didn't see any tables or chairs or anything mm -hmm. in there. I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't in there because the light was almost blinding, but I didn't see any. And when they when they carried me inside, they seemed to, to just lean me back, you know. And uh, this this eye, well, I keep referring to it as an eye, and it moved up to, in front of me about this closed. Mm -hmm. And it started right at my eyes, looking me right in the eye. Uh -huh. And it seemed to, it hesitated there for a, a, a few seconds, and it just started moving over my entire body. When they, they brought me uh, from the craft at, at long, along this area here, and they seemed to, they didn't drop me, you know, they just released me back to the ground, and uh, I fell. I, I don't know why my, my legs were weak. I don't know why it was the, the fright or what it was, but I, I fell onto the ground. And that's when I seen Calvin. He's standing right over here in this area, and he was standing facing the river with his arms outstretched like that, just like he was staring at something. Tell me about the lie detector test. Well, so that was run by Pilkington. Was it Pilkington? Uh, Pennington. Pennington. That they run this type of test about six times a day. And when they were asked to come over here to, to talk to these people, they had in their mind that they it was just a big joke. And if I understand it correctly, they ran one test on Mr. Hickson. The machine showed that he was telling the truth. Then they run another one. And then the examiner, he began to wonder himself. So he ran the third test, and he believed just what Mr. Hickson had told him. Mr. Booth, tell me what happened that night in October. Well, I got up and come, had turned off the TV and come to the front door, which you can see right behind me. 
just as usual checking to see if it was locked. So I looked out the window at the top and naturally I saw this object above the street light out there. So naturally it caught my eye where the lights was on it. Couldn't hear any racket or anything. So I opened the door after a few seconds to step out to see if I could really tell what it was it just took off. Can you describe it? Well, it was round, had lights all the way around it, turning in a counter clockwise motion. It had a dome on top with a bright light shining out through the top of it. To tell the actual figure of it or anything, you couldn't tell. You could just see the lights and the one on top. When it happened to Charlie, the creatures, whatever they were, didn't communicate with him. Now, it's enough to say you saw a UFO to, to give you trouble these days in some towns. To be taken aboard is, is, is just a suspect idea. But somehow, if the creatures don't give you a message, you're just a touch less incredible. And Charlie says that what he said and what we wrote about in the book uh, they, it was like they had a job to do and they came and they did it. I think there has to be a reason why that uh, Calvin and me was picked. Maybe because you could take it? Well, it might be. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that they, they know more of what's going on down here on this earth than we think. And I don't know, they might have been you might say looking for somebody that uh, that could uh, that could you might say hold up under the strain and uh, and convince people that that, uh, that that there is another world and there's some kind of life on that world. There were the ones that saw the basketball a UFO. We started off the morning heading to the Gulf Coast Gator Ranch in Moss Point. I was stoked. I had seen the place on a couple of episodes of Gator Boys. On the drive, Adam and I played the audio from the alien abduction news cases. We knew there were beings in the sky, but we were worried about the violent Rougarou and Bigfoot encounters locals had reported. Two boys were walking their German Shepherd in the woods. The dog ran off ahead and came back almost immediately, whimpering. They continued farther and saw a freshly killed boar. The hind legs were snapped in two. The ribs of the pig were impaled on a nearby pine tree. The symbol must be a warning or a tribal marker. We arrived at the Gator Ranch and signed up for an airboat tour. I admired all the cool knickknacks of the gift store and asked the lady at the front desk if she'd seen any strange creatures around. She said the dinosaurs out back were strange enough, but she did say that they filmed the TV show Killing Bigfoot right around the region. Before we knew it, our captain, Sam, was giving the rules and regulations of the Rougarou. That's right, our boat was named after the famed creature I was hoping to encounter. Adam's parents laughed, but were probably embarrassed when I asked if we would see any on our tour. Sam replied that we just might, and that his grandma used to warn him of the beast every time he would leave the house. We tore up the waterways with the fan boat. Sam was drifting and splashing like Paul Walker in Into the Blue. He showed us his blind gator named Ray Charles. He sure was happy to see us. He had a collection of marshmallows in his marshway. We pulled deep into the back of the lagoon, and he called for his gator friends. He gave off a loud coughing grunt and then called them in like they were dogs. In a few spots, the gators came right up to the boat, and in others, there was no response. One narrow canal had a couple of baby alligators, so we all began to search for the big bull. Sam said that there's one big alpha for every 250 acres. We were determined to find it. He turned the fan boat down and just coasted down the narrow stream. I shielded my face from the tree branches and kept my eye out for snakes. We checked every crevice for the dinosaur. We spotted some slide marks and could smell that he was nearby, but he must have been dug into the mud. We got to a part that was so thick, the only choice we had was to turn around. I had noticed a strange feeling, but just attributed it to the monster gator. Now that feeling of dread was knocking on my door. I could sense something was near. We had swum too far. I panned from left to right, searching for the source of this terror. The brush was thick and there was near zero visibility, but I knew that something had eyes on us. The horror felt like the sun, but was subtle as well. 
Sam noticed that I was scanning, and he worked his best to get that boat turned around. I think he had noticed it well before I did. We kicked off the trees and got her straightened out. He fired it up, but the motor started spitting. That was when the rest of the boat finally picked up on the unusual vibe coming from the swamp. But I had already been visualizing the creature from the Black Lagoon for what felt like hours. As the group stared at Sam, I nudged Adam, but he was already nose up like a dog. The pungent alligator smell had worsened into damp clothes, a chemically poisoned smell. It reeked like there was a den of roadkill buried away back into the hideout. The nest had to be nearby. There were bent trees and a still feeling in the air. I felt like we were surrounded, but luckily Sam got the boat running and we jetted out of there. When we slowed down, Sam said poachers were common in the area and he thought that we might have spooked one of them. Adam and I smirked at each other but the other families bought it. We found the big bull alligator in a lagoon near a wooden bridge on our way back, and Adam saw a giant prehistoric alligator gar, too. Never know what's going to happen out there. We got a picture with the captain and walked the ranch grounds. There were baby gators, eggs, and a boardwalk that took us over the water. There were dinosaurs everywhere. We saw a 17-foot bully that reminded me of Utan, the crocodile. I saw him in Myrtle Beach, and he's the largest held in captivity in the world. I imagined this place during a hurricane, and a chill went up my spine. It was time to go. After the ranch, Adam and I were in the mood for some trails. We hit Shepherd State Park and took off towards the tall trees along the Pascagoula River and Bayou. They were doing some construction on a cool river walk pathway that journeyed over the swampland about 12 feet up from the ground. Some parts were incomplete, so we had to jump across from beam to beam. It was risky because it was swamp land in every direction, and there was no easy way back up to safe land. There were gators, snakes, and of course, prowlers lurking nearby. It was the 50th day of summer. The sun was shining, and the wind felt just right. I was having a blast and let off a couple of Bigfoot roars. Immediately after, part of me regretted it because I didn't want to disrespect the natives of the land. I had no problem balancing and jumping across the high beams. My biggest enemy was my own stomach. It was growling louder than the beast in the woods. On one of the larger gaps that we had to cross, I put a little bit of extra oomph into it. And when I landed, my body just let go. I knew I had an emergency. There was a mess in my pants. I waddled to the end of the river walk and turned around the way we came. I hopped across the same high beams that almost killed me with the gross wet underwear. I kept checking the back of my legs to make sure it wasn't running. It wasn't bad, but it sure felt like a catastrophe. I wanted to keep my problem a secret. After a mile in the compromised position, I could already feel the inside of my thighs near my pelvis were chafing. I was in pain. It was damn near bleeding. My skin was rubbed raw. Once we turned onto the path into the forest, I said I had to go to the restroom. Adam continued going straight on the path, and I turned to the left. I jogged off out of sight and dropped my pants. As I was in the most vulnerable position, I almost shit myself again when I heard a loud ruckus just 20 yards from me in the thicket. I felt nauseous, but I knew I had to do something about my situation. I stared off towards the sound and moved very slowly. I peeked down towards my underwear and saw that I had to get rid of them. I unraveled them from my cargo shorts and slipped my shoes off. I took my socks off and wiped myself as best I could. It was gross, but needed to be done. I kept guard on the sound as I quietly buried my mistake. I pulled my pants up and finally took a breath. I was hit with a rotten stench that almost knocked me over. I'm sure I was partially to blame for the foul odor, but I believe the creature released pheromones to warn me. It hadn't moved since the crash. The smell and feeling reminded me of a skunk or a cat spraying, but multiplied by ten. It was marking its territory and wanted me gone. I could sense that with every atom in me. I put my shoes back on and ran towards Adam. He asked if I'd gotten lost, and I told him I got a little turned around just to cover up my accident. I asked him how long I was gone, and he said it was more than 10 minutes. It felt like only 30 seconds to me. We continued down the path, and I was trying not to do any more damage to my legs. The prowler was in the back of my mind, but with each step feeling like I was being dragged across concrete, I had a more imminent threat. Though I was still confused about the time gap, I had to make sure to keep up with Adam. He had rushed ahead and pointed towards a hole with a bunch of crab bones in it. It was cool, but nothing groundbreaking. 
We made it back to his parents and the campground in one piece. I went to the actual restroom and cleaned myself up as much as I could. I was thankful that I was able to manage it. I learned to always bring an extra pair of boxers with me. In the car, I pulled a tick out of my ear. Now that created a whole new level of paranoia. Chapter 13. Texas Woodboogers The Cowboys and Redskins are one of the most heated rivalries in sports. But did you know that they were on the same team? I've heard that everything's bigger in Texas. But also, beware of the boogeyman. Because before the Alamo, the Cowboys and Indians were at war against the Giants. Lines were drawn and others were crossed. But still to this day, the boogeyman lurks in the dark. Texas is filled with ghost towns, cartel horror stories, and tales from the wild, wild west. But here's an explanation of why the Dallas Mavericks affiliate team is called the Texas Legends. Even before the phantom of Texarkana caused towns to dread sundown, the boogeyman was lurking in the Longhorn State. The Falk monster was making a buzz across the state line in Boggy Creek during the 70s. The chupacabra lurks around the farms, and the dogmen patrol wildlands. After hours of driving across Texas plains, I felt like I was one of the leftovers heading to Jarden, searching for the sacred lands of miracle. But I think that was just heat exhaustion. We needed to rest. A storm was approaching and the sun was finally going down, so we had to find somewhere to sleep before we arrived in Dallas in the morning. We saw Tyler State Park ahead, and I thought that it would be a good idea to spend the night camping there. The other guys were not about it, but I knew we needed to pull over. Tents and rain don't coincide in their book. They were both like witches, scared to melt. Though none of us were in the mood to deal with the ranger at the front desk, so I wasn't going to argue with them. We decided to just pull off on the side of the road and sleep in the Isuzu. Fine by me. I climbed in the trunk and listened to the rain. After some exhausted, peaceful minutes, I dozed off to sleep. The rain continued to pour and I dreamt of my grandparents' farm. There was a dirt path that led to the magical pond. There were sharks that dug themselves into the mud and sand. I visited that path many times in my dreams. As they approached the water, the leviathans rushed away and violently shook the ground. The vibrations woke me up. Something had shaken the car. The storm was raging, and the lightning completely illuminated the sky. The heavy rain felt like marbles being dropped on the aluminum. I slowly opened my eyes and wondered if there was a lightning bolt that had hit near the car. I just hoped it wasn't the police. There were no lights, and the other guys were still comatose. I peeked my eyes out the back and patiently waited for more lightning. I scanned the wood line and down the road as far as I could see. I contemplated in my head it was all in my dream. If the heavy rain had just been playing tricks on my mind. I stared down the road and looked for a hitchhiker. I know they like to mess with drivers or could have just been trying to get out of the rain. I laid back down and tried to go back to sleep. My anxiety was running and I had knots in my stomach. Usually I enjoyed the rain. But now my room, or trunk, began to spin. I was nauseous and I had to throw up. I opened the back door and puked right outside the car. The rain poured in, and the guys woke up. I barely had anything in me, but still felt like I was choking on whatever was in the back of my throat. I stuck my fingers down as far as I could and tried to empty out all the toxins. The guys were drowsy, but still laughing, telling me to get it all out. The stomach bile burned my insides as it poured from my mouth. I felt like I was blacking out and had a presence watching me. I had the urge to slam the door shut, but still had more to retch. I knew the smell would attract predators like chum in the ocean. I imagined the chupacabra latching onto my neck and sucking my blood as I leaned over in a vulnerable position. I kept my watery eyes towards the darkness as I let out my last heave. I pictured Leatherface and his family surrounding our car. I slammed the door shut and told the boy that we had to go. They just took it as I was sick and ready to get moving. But in my mind, impending doom was approaching. I felt like I had been attacked. The being had entered my dreams and turned my stomach upside down. I hadn't been drinking and didn't have food poisoning, but was set in a trance state like I had been deep in both. We took off towards Dallas, and I couldn't have been more relieved. I remained in the trunk and kept my eyes towards our parking spot. I tried not to blink as I searched the shadows for the perpetrator. I'm not sure if it was clarity or pareidolia, but I saw at least five sets of eyes closing in on where we just were. This was an organized onslaught. We had a few hours until we could meet up with our couch surfing host, so we stopped for breakfast. As we pulled into the diner, I was happy to get my feet on the ground. 
I went straight to the bathroom and wiped some clean water on my face. I looked into the mirror and saw that my eyes were dilated. I looked like I was on drugs. My body was deeply affected. This wasn't just a fluke. My spirit was under fire. The mixture of heat exhaustion and lack of sleep surely would have some powerful side effects, but it just didn't make sense. The terror was too vivid. I was already sleeping, and that's what my body needed most. Naturally, I didn't think my insides would do the opposite of what was helping. My body was in defense mode, against an enemy that was previously unknown. The guys made jokes during breakfast, but I was just focused on replenishing. I sipped my orange juice slowly and nibbled at my eggs and toast. I felt better, but still had a blanket of strange feelings hovering over me. After we finished eating, we got a hold of our host and planned to meet at Dealey Plaza. As we approached the car, Bass noticed a few dents and scratches. They blamed it on Hale, but I knew exactly what it was. The Boogeyman. Chapter 14. Desert Apes Many native tribes believe that we live on a giant turtle, and their beliefs have more roots in reality than what modern science teaches. We are surrounded by mud fossils. The golden-aged titans were turned to stone when the floods poured from the heavens and ended the silicon air. The Stone Age carbon era began, and the remnants of the originals now stand as mountains. They are named Oregon Mountains for a reason. The desert can play tricks on one's mind, but that still doesn't change the fact that the hills have eyes. In these very mountains, there have been sightings of monsters and creatures since the beginning of time. UFOs roam the skies, and Chupacabra keeps the farmers up at night. But deep in the red rock, campers have been terrorized by tailless monkeys and desert apes with red eyes. Said to be a lost tribe of natives, these giant clans of predators still call the stone of Las Cruces and El Paso home. Mexican favelas were to my left and the beautiful UTEP campus to my right when I arrived in El Paso. We survived a flood and attempted carjacking and a couple of ghost towns. And that was just between here and Dallas. That 10-hour drive felt like days in the Texas sun. It was cool to see the mountains the farther west we went, but we all knew what that means. More mystery. We pulled off to Dripping Springs in Las Cruces for a hike into the mountains. I was excited to get off the road for a bit. We hit the visitor center and checked the map for our journey. I noticed a spot on the opposite side of the trail called Hermit's Cave. We needed to check that out. The cave had been used for shelter by humans for 5,000 years, but was named after one of its 1800s residents. There was a medicine man named Giovanni Maria de Agostini. He traveled through Peru, Brazil, Chile, and many other South and Central American countries. He walked across America and lived in Vegas for a while. He was 62 when he moved into La Cueva. The monk healed people with herbs and potions and gained many followers. He lit a torch at the cave entrance every Friday evening to communicate with the outside world. Sadly, the fire went out when he was mysteriously murdered. Stabbed in the back with no leads. His murder was never solved. He is honored worldwide in festivals and parades, and his pilgrimage route is protected by the National Park. After paying our respects at the cave, we stopped for a water break before hitting the Red Path. I was excited to cool off in the springs and get an eye on this waterfall. I had climbed Dunn's River Falls in Jamaica, been on Maid of the Mist in Niagara, and explored countless Ohio cascades. It was time to add one more obscure visit to my collection. The trail was more difficult than it appeared to be. There was a gradual incline that you could only feel in your legs. We passed many people on the way back, and they were all smiling. We were exhausted and wondering how these people found the energy. That spring must really be like the fountain of youth. Some hikers warned us that they'd seen a rattlesnake just ahead on the trail. We were on high alert. A bite this far from the parking lot and hospital would most likely be deadly. Each step was prepared with precaution. We continued forward with our eyes on the mountains and the other on the trail. I jumped when I saw a giant tarantula, but wanted it as a pet after a few minutes. After more hiking, we reached Boyd Sanitarium. We explored the ruins and searched for hidden mysteries. There used to be a hotel and resort up in the mountains that used the spring's healing characteristics to their advantage. I sat on the old porch and imagined the breath of life that used to pump through the valley. It was the closest thing to heaven I'd ever been. We split up on the rest of the hike towards the springs. The trail broke off in multiple branches and I took the high ground. I was exploring the large rock area searching for caves and hieroglyphs. 
Bass appeared to be on the ledge that looked impossible to reach, and Polk remained on the main path, petrified of heights. The water was flowing and the creek below was glistening. I climbed over to the water and took off my shoes. I swam in the knee-deep water searching for little fish and fossils. I made cups with my hands and enjoyed the cold drink. I filled up our bottles and felt like a new man. I was tying my wet hair into a ponytail when I felt like I was being watched. I checked for more hikers and searched all the locations we'd just entered, but saw no clues. The sun was going down soon and the park would be closed, so I figured that we were the last hikers on the dirt. I kept my composure and continued searching crevices and hollows for anything I could find. But, but now in the back of my head, I wasn't looking for snakes and rabbits. I was on alert for the mountain lions and black bears. I wasn't too nervous about the bobcats and coyotes, although a pack of them would be a problem. This presence was unlike anything natural in the forest that I have encountered. My sixth sense was ringing. I made my way to Bass, and before I could even say anything, he told me that we were being hunted. He thought he saw some movement in the distance. He believed tribes of people still inhabited the region, and they terrorized anyone who stays too long. He was describing the hills have eyes, but I have no idea what might have been after us. I have heard many stories of the wild people who inhabited the Red Rock. We got packed up and started back towards the car. The walk back was mostly downhill, but the sun was moving away quickly. We were in a race against the dark. I felt like I was on the run from vampires. We decided not to tell Polk. He was driving and we needed his mind clear. Bass and I kept an eye on our six the entire time. We both felt like we were being pursued. We could feel a presence closing in on us. The car was in sight and the moon was creeping out. We were basically on the edge of the earth and the shadows were trying to swallow us. We kept our pace forward and luckily got back to the parking lot. We hopped in the car and slammed the doors behind us. I took a few deep breaths and sank deep in my seat. My spirit was exhausted and my aura had been targeted. I felt like I was hiding from the graboids and ducking monsters. I wouldn't have been surprised if we had began being hunted by the killer tire from rubber at this point. The desert is a strange place. It consumes you.